Hello, and welcome to Shifting the Atmosphere with Federica, where I talk to ordinary people doing some extraordinary things. I'm your host, Federica Peterson. I'm a certified executive and life coach, business mentor, best-selling author, and adjunct professor. I'm here to partner with you in your transition journey to help build your confidence, elevate your thinking, and shift your perspective to empower you to cast a new vision and redefine what's possible, or in other words, shift your atmosphere. My guest today will be talking about his book, Master of Ceremonies, A Male's Guide for Successful Life. We're going to learn how running over a nail and having to repair a tire led my guest to write a book that's changing the lives of hundreds of young people. Raised in Fort Washington, Maryland, Mr. Jonathan C. Harris has served in leadership positions his entire life, from being manager of the school store in elementary school to president of the Homeless Awareness Club in middle school to president of the National Honor Society in high school. Jonathan majored in statistics at the University of Delaware, where he served as a resident assistant and peer mentor for freshman students. Jonathan currently works at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania as a residence hall coordinator, where he oversees two residence halls. He's planned and presented at numerous seminars and conferences related to issues on college campuses. He has received several honors and awards, including high school valedictorian, Residence Hall Coordinator of the Year, Dean's List, Residence Life People's Choice Award, Kiwanis Club Citizens Award, and the Excellence in Service to Students Award. Jonathan published his debut book, Master of Ceremonies, in 2016. He also recently launched his own business called Judicious Life, where he hosts community workshops, provides individual life coaching, and makes weekly inspirational videos called Words for Wednesday. He hosts his own weekly radio show called Thinking Out Loud, where he speaks on issues in the community. This year, he'll be releasing his second book, which will be a children's book, a new blog, as well as a software app that promotes safe and productive living. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm excited to have you here today. So it's the rite of passage for all my guests. Please share... How did you get where you are today? We want to know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as you know, I'm a published author. I wrote the book, Master of Ceremonies, A Male's God for a Successful Life. And the story to how it came about is probably one of the most interesting stories that I ever get to tell people. But basically, it started when I ran over a nail. I was coming home from somewhere, and I hit a nail. I remember my tire started to go flat a little bit, so... Uh, my grandfather and I took it to get some air, but he told me it's going to basically need a, a new tire. So I take it to the auto shop. I go to put the um, go to put the car in the shop to uh, get a new tire. And anytime you do maintenance on a the car, they want to ask you what's wrong. So they give me this form. I'm filling out the form, and I put that I need a tune-up. Now at the time, I didn't know anything about you know what a tune-up actually does. Okay, so, so wait a minute. You, you you had a flat tire, and you told them you needed a tune-up. Yes. <laughs> okay, carry on. <laughs> so <laughs> so when, I, when I get the car back, uh, the tire is fixed, but the total is about $280. And I'm sitting here like, oh, that's kind of high. So I'm talking to my father about it, and he's like, why did you pay all that money from a, for a tire fix? And I'm like, well, I said I needed a tune-up. I thought that was it. He's like, no, a tune-up is more so the wiring, not the – the tires, I'm like, oh, my goodness. So here I am. I, I paid all this extra money, all this wasted time, everything, because I didn't think to ask somebody who knew a little bit more about cars than I did. So mm-hmm. I'm sitting here, and I'm like, wow. You know, at the time, I'm, I'm 24, so I've had some world experience, but not all the worldly experiences yet. And I'm thinking how many other people in the world probably don't know this either. Mm-hmm. So then it starts to come to me. I'm like, well, what if I put together a book of helpful tips and hints on ways to get around things that many people probably do not know how to do? So that was the beginning of Master of Ceremonies. Wow. Unbelievable. Now, there's definitely some other things that you do. You, you have the book. I believe you have a radio show. And there's a few other things that you do. So how did you go from 
getting on the radio, or how did you even get on the radio? That, that's probably another uh, question because I know folks ask me that all the time. So that's also a, a funny story as well. Um, I work at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, which is the first historically black. Uh, university, actually the first degree-granting historically black uh, college and university. And one day I was in the cafeteria, and my job is I'm what's called a residence hall coordinator. So I oversee a residence hall that has students to live in them, and my job is to kind of give them tips and mentor them to get through their freshman year. So I'm I'm getting on one of my students because I, I believe in holding students accountable. That's how we kind of change the world is, you know, telling them what they need to do. And there was this guy sitting behind us, and I guess the student had left to go get some food. We're in the cafeteria, and he was just like, I want you to relax. You just seem like a student who kind of has everything on the ball. You're always going, but, you know, enjoy college. And I'm telling him, I actually work at the school we had never met before. So we have, like, this funny kind of interaction, and we introduced ourselves. Come to find out the guy sitting behind me is the radio station manager. So from there, we kind of uh, built a relationship. He became my mentor, and I, you know, went by his office every day, talked to him. So as I'm telling him about the book, you know, it's months later, I'm saying, hey, I'm writing a book. It's on its way out. And he's talking, he's like, it would be really great if you had a show to go along with that because a lot of the topics that you're going to put in your book are things that we, you know, students should learn about too. So I'm going to my room like, oh, that's kind of cool. So I go home, I think about it, it's like, you know what? I think I'm going to do a radio show. The rest <laughs> is history. Wow. That's awesome. That's, that's pretty cool. And that you got the opportunity to do that. That's great. So I'm going right, to Right, all hear because that he overheard me getting on a student, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. So I know you mentioned, you know, with a couple of things there, right? So when you were talking about the book, it sounds like the, the big thing that came out for you with that was, how many other people don't know these simple things that I didn't know? And to some of us, they, you know, they seem so obvious, but they're not. You're realizing that they're not. What made you really understand that, that others, you know, other folks your age or young people your age may not know some simple things like that about life that, you know, may be making their life a little more difficult than necessary? Right. One of the biggest things with that is I have about, I'd say anywhere between – four and six really close friends, and most of them actually were raised in single-family homes. Now, Mm -hmm. my, you know, my experience growing up was a little bit different in the sense that uh, my mom and dad are married, you know, have been married for 30-plus years, and, you know, still are married. So I was able to have the experiences of both and, you know, help me kind of grow up. But a lot of my friends have either never met their father or dad has, you know, made minor appearances and then exited his life again. So I've I've seen how it affected them. And we've had little situations such as, let's say we had an assembly to go to or some type of special event where we had to dress up and they don't know how to tie ties or things where being able to rely on a father or uncle or a grandfather or big brother, they didn't have those, those resources that I did. And I, you know, I always felt bad. So Writing this book is kind of my way to make every guy in the world never feel like he's at a disadvantage because of the lack of men in his life. Mm, okay. And that boils down to something else I heard you say, which is really around mentorship, which yes. is something it sounds like you're doing as well. And, and it sounds like you may have a passion about that. So how important has it been for you to have mentors in your life? I think you said some, some semblance of that, but what would you say? Uh, mentorship has been very crucial for me. I know that not only have I tried to get mentors for my own life, but I've tried to be a mentor for other people's lives. So I have mentors in different aspects of my life. I have a mentor that more so I talk to about personal things, financial goals, and just my spiritual well-being. And then I have more so professional mentors that talk to me about the job search process, especially in the field of work that I do, because they have those connections. They've worked some of those positions, and they can tell me what I need to do to set myself up up for those next level promotions and positions. Uh, when it comes to my interactions with having mentees, I right now have a mentee probably in each sector of life. I have a mentee in middle school, high school, a couple in college, and I have some now out in the professional world that are currently working. So with each one, it really just varies on what their needs are and how I can best help them. You know, with some, some mentees, we get together maybe 
every couple months. We may go to dinner and just talk about things. Some mentees I talk to a couple times a week, and it really just is based on what they need from me. I try to help them out there. That's interesting. And one of the things that you were saying was that you have multiple mentors. So talk about that a little bit. I I ascribe to that as well, but I want the listeners to understand how that that may be important. Well, mentorship is – it's it, it it takes on many forms again based on what you need. So, uh, fin- um, one one area that I'm looking to add a mentor to is a financial mentor, and that person specifically, whether it be a financial advisor or someone that has a background in finance, that can really help me shape my money differently, how I spend money, how I think about it, so that I can build uh, future things and that I can accomplish some of my goals where money's required. You know, for the spiritual, that's probably the most important because. You know, being an author, also working a full-time job, I I blog, I'm starting my own life coaching company, and just several other endeavors, radio show, it can be very easy to get overwhelmed, and especially I'm 26, so, you know, to be handling a lot of major projects at the same time while still trying to, you know, tackle even more with each passing day can make even the most balanced person become crazy. So that that spiritual mentor is that person who sits down with you and helps you kind of put things into perspective. They teach you how to pray. They pray with you. Um, You know, they teach you balance. That tends to be a, a major issue with young people is we're very scattered. Sometimes you need someone to bring you back together and help you just focus on one thing at a time. So having mentors in different aspects of your life really will set you up so that everything can get done properly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it gives you that, that level of support in each of those areas of life. And so I'm, I'm hearing you and you're saying that it sounds like you're going to be expanding into doing coaching, which is awesome. And so how is that going to look different from your mentorship or for your mentees if you move into coaching? How will you be providing service a little differently for someone that you're coaching versus someone that you're mentoring? That's a really good question. Uh, With coaching, I've always looked at it as though you, A, you probably do not know the person, so that element of attachment is no longer there with the exception that you still want them to be successful, but you don't always know the backstory to why they have that personality and things Mm -hmm. like that. You also try to, for me, I want to develop a system where the person that I'm coaching takes ownership over the experience and that they're happy with the final product. Um, even if it's not something you agree with, your job is to kind of help them brainstorm and to help them get on a plan that, you know, will work best for them and that they can do. A lot of times with mentoring, we, we know the person, so we tend to, again, have those experiences. We, like, for example, with my students at the college, I'm mentoring them, but because I work here, I also have access to things like their grades, so I would know okay, maybe you shouldn't take 17 credits of all math and science courses because looking at last semester, this happened when you tried that. You don't always get that information when you're coaching someone, so you have to, you get a chance to be a little more objective. Right, right. No, I would agree with that. That's a great point that you brought out as well. It's really around the person coming up with the answer. You're just supporting them to come to that and not being judgmental in it. Where when you're mentoring, you've got a little bit more vested interest, you know the person, and you may be a little bit more apt to give advice versus Mm someone that you're coaching, right? Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. And so the book really sounds like it was inspired from your passion of mentoring, but what really inspired you to write the book? I mean, I know you were talking about the fact that you had that trouble when you were, you needed to get the tire fixed and you actually did a tune-up, but... I'm wondering if there was something a little deeper that really allowed you to, that inspired you to write that book. Yeah, there's a, there's an assortment of things. Like I mentioned, I talked about the, you know, males having pride issues. I spoke Mm -hmm. on, you know, having friends that grew up in single family homes and watching them kind of feel disadvantaged. There are some other things that I like to uh, teach. I like to help young men basically improve their self-esteem. Self-esteem is essentially the engine for which our life operates. I, you know, without good self-esteem, it's very hard to pretty much do anything that's going to progress you forward. So I know even growing up myself, there were areas of my life where I felt as though I wasn't the best at it. And yeah. as a result of my confidence not being where it needed to be, that as, you know, sometimes maybe I didn't feel comfortable applying for something. I didn't think I would get picked. Or 
you know, I felt like I had to look a certain way in order to get attention from the female and just all of those different things. So definitely um, helping people improve their self-esteem, you'll mm-hmm. tend to see a lot better productivity from them once their self-esteem is improved. Yeah, I think that applies to most people, right? When right. you have confidence in yourself, you can conquer the world, you know? <laughs> There's something about that. There really is something to that. So I have another question for you, and I think this came out in some of our earlier discussions when we were talking about the show and, and so forth, but one of the things that I was wondering, from your perspective, why is it that you feel our young people may not be as equipped for life as they should be? Right. Um, yeah. One of the things that I love about currently working at a college while still being an author is that I kind of live this every day. I get to see the the progression of our young people because I work with 17 and 18 and up, um, you know, students for a living. And one of the things that I notice is that the role of the parent has really changed. Mm-hmm. I think that when you have parents who want to do things for their child, versus just kind of supporting them through it or helping them with it, it changes the child's role in the whole situation. So I'll give you an example. Um, We've had situations where a student may get in trouble up here at the school. Maybe they start hanging out with the wrong crowd. They let their grades drop. Mm -hmm. We've had parents call us and say, it's your fault, meaning the school administrators, that my child is now a drug dealer or my daughter is pregnant, and Yes, there are systems in place to help your student, and obviously every student won't take advantage of those systems, but for a parent to make such heavy statements like that, that it's our fault that their child, keyword their child, became a drug dealer or whatever they choose to get involved with, logically it doesn't make that much sense. Now, maybe there's some biasness there because I do work at a school, but... It's one of those things where where's the part in this situation where you sit down with your child and discuss their role and how they became involved with what they did? Mm-hmm. That's, that's one thing that I really, you know, when I sit down with parents and we, we talk about it, a lot of times there's a lot of discussion about how the school has failed your child, not how your child has failed themselves. And over time, the child now or the the young person, however old they are, has kind of gotten a pass on their behavior because they go, oh, we can blame the school for why I'm getting all F. It's easier to say, oh, the teacher doesn't teach in a way that I need to learn, so I failed all the tests. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're not ever having to accept responsibility for what they say and what they do to people. So over time, um, when things happen and they can't get mom and dad to help them out of it, they take it so much harder. Their coping skills aren't as strong mm-hmm. because they're, they're used to that, that family always stepping in. You know, they try out for football. They don't get picked for football. A long time ago, it was, I'm going to work harder, and next year I'm going to make the team. Now it's, you know, parents cussing out the coach or arguing with the coach about his decision-making skills and why your child didn't get picked. Right. That's, oh, boy, yeah, that's a whole <laughs> other topic. You're absolutely right about that because the accountability piece is key in the maturing process, right? right? Because as adults, we are accountable for everything, and once you realize that the choices that you make have consequences, and exactly. when your parent takes away that consequences, you really don't understand how to navigate and make proper choices because there's been no consequence in the, in the in past, right? Exactly. And so it makes it really, diff- it's really difficult for that whole problem-solving process to mature in, in, in young adults. So I really like what you're saying there. I want to talk about this some more, but we got to take a break. <laughs> we have to take a break. <laughs> Good discussion. I want to um, make sure that the listeners know how to get in touch with you. Jonathan, so could you share your website and some other ways that they might be able to connect with you? Sure. So I'm located on social media. That's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Author John. And my website is www.jonathanc, as in Christopher, Harris.com. So, again, that's www.jonathanc.harris.com. Perfect. And they, I would imagine they could get the book on your website as well, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, it's awesome. available on Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and thousands of other distributors. But if you go to jonathancharris.com, there is a link that will take you to be able to purchase it. Perfect. All right, you're listening to Shift in the Atmosphere with Federica, and we'll be back in just a moment. Hi, this is Federica Peterson, host of Shifting the Atmosphere with Federica. Join me every Monday at 5 p.m. as I talk to ordinary people, 
doing some extraordinary things. So if you need a dose of inspiration, motivation, healing, or direction, I guarantee you'll find it here. My guests have some incredible stories of perseverance, determination, and resilience that are sure to give you the perspective and insights and even the skills that are going to help you shift your atmosphere. On social media, I'd love for you to connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at Frederica Peterson. Or to learn more about the show or how to contact me, visit www.shiftingtheatmosphere.net. We're back. You're listening to Shifting the Atmosphere with Federica, and I'm here with my guest today, Jonathan C. Harris, and he's the author of Master of Ceremonies, A Male's Guide for a Successful Life. And we were just having a conversation around having young people be accountable. Jonathan works at Lincoln University, which is in the Philadelphia region, and he works with a lot of young people. And the book that he wrote really kind of centered around mentorship um, in a way because it really helped those young people navigate through life. But I don't want to steal his words. <laughs> I want to talk about that a little bit, Jonathan, right? We started talking about the accountability and, and being able to exercise mature choices in order to be able to mature properly and, and make good decisions in life. And so where do you see the biggest challenge with them not being able to navigate through some of those things because proper choices aren't being made because they haven't really been able to experience that because it's kind of been taken away from them because we've had people stepping in. Right. So as I mentioned, again, before the break, we have a lot of times where we're just trying to encourage our parents and families to allow the child to essentially make their own mistakes. It's, it's okay. Most things in life that you mess up on, you'll have the opportunity to do them differently or to do them over. So we, I, just, I, can't, I cannot stress this enough that we, we have to, as the, the uncles, I'm an uncle of a four-year-old nephew and a six-year-old nephew. And sometimes I see them doing things that, you know, obviously I'm going to have to help out. But sometimes there are certain things they're going to have to make those mistakes. And that's how they learn. That's how they improve. But I'm just so fearful that of today, our current crop of teenagers and young adults will say ages 18 to 25 have not been allowed to properly make mistakes. You know, we have parents who, you know, they're writing the papers for these young men and women. They are doing the art projects. They're doing the science fair projects. And it, it, at the time that it's being done, I'm sure the families really think that they're helping, but long term, the, the young man or young lady doesn't really have these skills because if you don't pick up the phone and you can't answer it for them, now they don't know. I, I watched it happen the other day. We asked a student who needed to give us some information so we could help him in the office, what's your ID number? He turns and looks at mama to give him the information. This is your student ID number. You're the one who goes to school. And that, that culture of mama and daddy, uncle and aunt, grandma and grandpa, legal guardian, whomever, is just so much more invested than the actual person who's doing the experiences. That's absolutely true. And do you think that that could possibly be linked to um, what could be considered to be a challenge or a lack of control with young people? Oh, absolutely. I think that when it comes to control, usually after making a mistake, you have the opportunity to reflect and that's how change is made is, okay, you saw what happened, you saw how you responded, and you see what the outcome was of that decision. So now you say, moving forward, I won't handle it that way. If we keep taking opportunities from our young people to have that reflection period, you know, the first time something happens could be a very major situation, whether that's running with a, a, a cop or something even more major that affects their ability to, you know, still go to school or, you know, something that affects their money or just future career opportunities. True. Very true. Very, very true. And so what's one small thing that they can do in order to maybe start working in the right direction to, to help them work that muscle a little bit more? Well, the biggest thing, and this is um, e a lot easier said than done, but when it comes to developing independence, it's having a conversation with those members in your circle, whether it be family or close friends, who are always stepping in and doing things for you. So I know growing up, 
my parents, they, um, you know, I love them to death and they always love to help, but I've had to tell them, you know, I got this, like, I know where to find you if I have questions. Um, as I've gotten older, I've had to apply that even more, especially after that tire situation. But see, mm-hmm. I was the exact opposite as a kid. I was a kid who probably should have asked questions and then something happened, but um, I always was one who liked to try things on my own before I, you know, press the help button. So teaching teaching students that you, you have those resources there if you need them, but really sit down and determine when that need is necessary. That's mm-hmm. the big thing. So, for example, okay, a student who's filling out financial aid paperwork for the first time. Some of the questions on that paper are things as simple as what is your home address? And you, in your mind, you already are defeated like, oh, this is just a lot of questions. I can't do any of this. But really sit down and look at it. Name, mm-hmm. phone number, address. You, you know those things. Right. Oh, yeah, and absolutely. So just really teaching them that, you know, if you really just take a second, think about what's being asked of you nine times out of ten, those people in your corner have probably given you the steps or hopefully have talked to you about it so that you can do it on your own. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that I can relate to with that, I just, um, I'm an adjunct professor at a university as well, and I've been teaching a master's program around interviewing. And okay. And the, the, whole, the whole crux of that class was really when you're trying to teach people how to interview from a leader perspective that haven't really held any of those leadership roles, how are you supposed to teach them that unless you're teaching them textbook, which I don't firmly believe in. I think you have to use some real world at oh, some point, because, right, in order for them to be able to apply and be interested in it. And so the whole crux of my class was learning how to ask questions, because there's an art to that. And asking questions and understanding, um, having an understanding of what you need to ask and why you need to ask it, and what you're going to gain from knowing that information, and so forth and so on. It is such an intricate process, but it not only is for the person that is looking for the answer, for the person that's asking the question, it is very empowering when you understand the kinds of questions that you need to ask. Right? Oh, yeah. It makes you stop and think. To your point, when you were talking about the form and, you know, understanding what you're filling out. It, it, it's stopping and thinking about what you're doing. And, and one of the things that I really impressed upon my students was that with the types of questions that you ask really show people, or it is a demonstration of, to people, how you think, how you process, how mature you are, how intelligent you are. Whether you like it or not, it literally does kind of help people assess where you're at. In maturity wise, in intellect, so forth and so on. And the more they came to understand that was through asking more questions. And so right. I like what you're saying about, you know, really challenging them to sit and focus because I think what happens now is our young people have more things to distract them than they ever had before. Than ever. Oh, yes. I forget it when I was in college. That was decades ago. But now <laughs> I don't even understand how they're focusing. And the things that they do focus on are so quick. You know, they, they get their responses so quickly because of all the different digital mediums that they are working through that it's really hard when you do need to sit down and think to get them to sit and think. But that is so necessary for their mind to formulate and for them to really pull out their potential. I love that you're focusing on that. But how is it that you are able to allow them to see that? Is there those moments when you can see those students come up with the light bulb moments or maybe some of the people that you're mentoring that have those light bulb moments and go, oh, yeah, I need to do more of this? Yeah, we we have a lot of those interactions. And that's, you know, honestly, that's why I became a mentor in the first place is just, you know, sometimes they, a lot of it starts with self-doubt. And that goes back to self-esteem, as I was mentioning. So when they say, you know, I'm not good enough, or I can't, or I don't know. What I always do with anything, I take the big issue, and I'll work with them to kind of break it down. So, for example, they'll say, there's no way that I can pay for graduate school. It costs $10,000 a semester. Okay. That does sound like a lot. However, when you look at it like this and say from September, let's say the semester starts in September, to December, now we're talking about four months. So we're taking Mm -hmm. 10,000 and we're dividing it by four. That's Mm -hmm. a lot more realistic to figure out how you can come up with that than to just look at the number 10,000 and get defeated. And again, that goes back to what we were saying about that stopping and thinking piece. Yes. 
Yeah. So when they, so after we're done talking and kind of brainstorming, because that's one thing that I enjoy doing is I like working through things with people and just having them write it out or however they need to process it. Mm-hmm. And they go, you know what? That doesn't sound so bad anymore. I was like, well, it never was bad. You just kind of were looking at it from one perspective, and the yep. perspective you chose just seems really overwhelming, but it's actually not. Right. Right. And you unlock their potential to be able to see it from another perspective, which right. then they can kind of own it a little bit more. And it's not so scary. I don't want to run from it or I need my mom or dad to help me with it. No, you can do this thing. I love that, Jonathan. I really do. That's Thank good you. Stuff. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, that's good stuff. And, it, and, it's, and it's huge. I think whenever you work with anybody, I know he's an, the coach. You have to start with the smaller pieces in order for people to be able to accept it. Because if it's too big, and I think that's any of us, right? If it's too overwhelming, right, we, we can't deal with it because life can be overwhelming. So forget having one issue that's a little bit more over, overwhelming than the others. We're going to keep pushing that thing under the rug <laughs> until yeah. it hopefully goes away. But we all know that it doesn't go away. It gets bigger and it turns into this ugly monster. And you know how that goes. I don't need to explain it to you. I think you know how that goes. But when oh, you're able absolutely. to break it down into to smaller chunks, that actually teaches them to take some of those bigger issues that will come along in life and, and remember, oh, you know what, I just need to break this down into to smaller pieces because I probably can do this. And what you're doing with them is really helping to build their confidence, just like you said. I, 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 I really, really like that. And so when you think about that, I think self-control comes into play. When, when, you, yes. when you're talking about helping them own that and, you know, really being able to adjust it and see it from another perspective. And so what are they going to gain by having not only that confidence, but that confidence is then going to translate into more self-control because they're owning it more, right? They're seeing a little bit more of themselves and the actions and the, and the consequences that are going on. But what are they going to gain? What are they going to gain from that self-control and why? Well, the biggest thing that I see with self-control is that, it, it really it puts you in that next level. Um, a lot of times, like I said, for what I do for a living, I work with sometimes 17-year-olds. Most are 18, between 18 and 22. And I've watched a lot of opportunities be taken away from people, unfortunately, because they don't have self-control. But for the students that I've been able to kind of get through to, they very soon after good things have happened and then they'll see like, oh, okay, I realized that doing it this way or at least, you know, having that self-control, having that confidence and tapping into my potential, I'm now eligible for these new things. I can now build upon that. I can do these things. Whatever it is that I want to do, it's within your reason. Um, you spend a lot less time being stressed just on the mental side. You know, in my book, I talk about mental health and how a lot of us hold on to situations with people that didn't go our way or just things that didn't go our way and how it really takes a toll on your body. So that form mm-hmm. of self-control of knowing you don't always need to respond to people who say negative things about you. Mm, that's right. Um, that's something that I, you know, I really take to heart. My students will tell me, Mr. Harris, you know, they call me Mr. Harris. Some of my students even call me Uncle John. But they're just like, you're always so calm. And mm-hmm. I said, but you have to be. There are people yeah. sitting in jail right now because they couldn't control their temper and they swung right. because someone said something. There are people who have lost their kids because they lost control of a situation and something bad happened to a child. So it's just like, what do you really have to lose from cursing someone out? What do you have to lose from these bad things? That should be what kind of keeps you together. Those should be your checks and balances, or what are the consequences of not having self-control? Right, and and having it from that perspective, because then there's really more tools in your arsenal belt than you realize. You know, one of the things when you were just bringing that up, that's kind of a sore spot for me when I see people lash out. And you can just look at any reality show and watch people act like lunatics, right? And, and it's mm-hmm. easy for me to sit there and say that I'm watching that and going, look at you. But I think we all have those moments, right? Certainly not maybe to the extent of what we, what we might be seeing on that. But um, And you may see some of this more in school because, of course, you're dealing with younger folks and they're still learning their vocabulary. But one of the things that I've always said to young people, especially those that I know, that tend to want to lash out at things, people that want to lash out in a destructive way don't have the vocabulary to be able to, to articulate themselves. And right. what we need to, re- right? And, and what we need to do, and I think, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to get too political, but one of the things that I did, I've always admired about President Obama and the First Lady Michelle is that they have the vocabulary to be able to articulate in adverse situations. And, and that has always been a, a, a go-to for me, you know, not just from them. I mean, I learned this from my father. 
you you don't always lash out without being able, you know, without thinking first. Because when you do that, you're letting your emotions override, and you're not using all the arsenals in your tool belt. You you know what I mean? You're not using all the thing, all the vocabulary that you have, and all the wisdom, and all of those things, and you're allowing somebody else to control you. But when you are in control of yourself, and when you are in a place that you are able to own who you are, love who you are, honor who you are, then you're going to respond differently. Right? right. I mean, you're just going to be. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the same exact way. Um, yeah. Believe it or not, sometimes in our society, it's set up where people will almost make you believe that you're the crazy one for having yep. self-control. Absolutely. And especially, like I said, I work with young people. So they're like, Mr. Harris, what do you mean when you, you know, they say something to you, you don't say something back? I said, everything mm-hmm. doesn't deserve a response. Yeah, and right. even when, when, I, when I disagree with people, I'm, I'm from the school of agree to disagree. You yeah. know, your favorite team may be the Dallas Cowboys, mine may be the Washington Redskins. Just yeah. because we don't have that in common, you and I should not be fighting about that. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't mean I can give you all the arguments in the world why my team is better, but at the end of the day, you still have to feel how you feel, and that's okay. We're different people. Yeah. We have different experiences. So what I, what I often um, – I see this quote on Facebook, and I try to live by it, but they say, don't raise your, don't raise your tone, improve your argument. And oh, times, yes. Love that. that oh, my that tone, goodness. That I love of, that. Do not raise your tone, raise the argument. I love it. Love it. Yeah, so the, the, the tone of voice represents you kind of feeling like you're against the wall. You know, the other person making good points. you got to defend yourself. So you're just going to now start screaming, and you're getting closer to them, and you're calling them all types of words that should, no one should ever be called. It's, mm-hmm. like you said, because we just need to find a new way to communicate, and sometimes yeah. that's going to be enhancing your vocabulary. Absolutely. And sometimes, to your point, it is to walk away. And, and I yes. have used that on many occasions because I, I am a proclaimed hothead. <laughs> and when there are times when I know I'm going to do something to get me in trouble, I will walk away. Let me. Yep. And it is the best thing. You know what I mean? I may have to walk away and find a punching bag, but I have walked away. And usually when I go back and look at that 20, 30 minutes, an hour later, whatever that is, I am so grateful that I did because I would have done something silly that would have just caused me angst for probably more days to come. And yes. so it's just a better way to think, and I love that. I really, really do. And mm-hmm. I know I have another question for you that I know we're going to jump into, but we've got to take a break before we do it because it was really all around success. And I want to talk to you about what you feel the definition of success is because I know it's different for everyone, and I know that that's oh, probably absolutely. a discussion that you have with some of your mentees, so that, that's um, interesting. So I want folks to know how to get in touch with you before we take the break. So if you could just share how they can connect with you. Sure. So I'm located on Facebook. Um, I'm also on Instagram and Twitter at Author John. Uh, you can also go to my personal website, JonathanCHarris.com, where you can also find my book, Master of Ceremonies, A Male's Guide for a Successful Life, and it's for sale. Perfect. Thanks, Jonathan. We'll be back in just a moment. Hi, this is Federica Peterson of Shifting the Atmosphere with Federica, and I want to share an empowering moment with you about the power of choice. With dreams come vision, and with vision comes choices. Every choice you make will either draw you closer or further away from the vision you have for your life, your career, your relationships. The list goes on. Being intentional about the steps you take to get closer to the things you want comes down to one small thing, choices. So here are five basic principles about choices. One, everyone has the power to choose. Two, you wake up every day with a choice. Three, excuses are just that. A choice is a choice. Four, what a difference a choice makes. And five, if you didn't have a choice, who'd you give it to? These are thoughts to live by, and this has been Frederica Peterson of Shifting the Atmosphere with Frederica. You can catch my show right here every Monday at 5 p.m. We're back. This is Frederica, and you're listening to Shifting the Atmosphere with Frederica, and I'm here today with my guest. Jonathan C. Harris, and he is the author of Master of Ceremonies, A Male's Guide for a Successful Life. And we were talking about, we were talking about a whole lot of things, but we were getting ready to get into the discussion of success. And I know from previous conversations that we've had when we were talking about this show that you believe that everyone's definition of success is different. So tell me what you mean by that. So when I, when I say that success looks differently for everyone, I, I believe that 
Well, personally, my definition of success is the ability to have choices. If you're someone that you can say, I don't feel like going to work today and it doesn't catastrophically affect anything, you, you live in a place where you have a choice now. When you have to go to work, whether you feel like it or you don't, you kind of don't have a choice anymore. So I wouldn't consider that to be success um, unless it's set up that that's what you want to do. But when I look at success, um, I try to encourage everyone to define their own standard and live by that. Uh, Sometimes standards get applied to you, and you'll find yourself being considered not successful because you don't meet the standard definition of success. So I'll give you an example. Um, As you know, I'm an African-American male. I'm 26. And based on what I do for a living, um, you know, working at a university, being an author, doing some other things like radio, there are some who would consider me successful. There are others who would not consider me successful because, let's say, I don't have a sports car, I don't make, you know, six to seven figures yet, Mm -hmm. and things like that. So a lot of times when it comes to, especially um, males of color, the, the standard gets put on us that your definition of success is a big house, a nice car, a high-paying job, and an attractive wife. And if you don't meet those four, you're considered not successful. And I think that's a really unfair standard because what you're doing is you're taking people who have passions and skill sets in other areas and you're making them feel as though they're not good enough because they don't maybe care about income. You know, there are some people who make, $30,000 for a living, they manage their money well, all their bills are paid, and they're happy with that standard of living. But if you now tell them you have to go make six figures before we classify you as successful, they feel like they have to leave that job, get a second job, or do other things that they wouldn't feel comfortable with just so that they can get the respect of being considered successful. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right about that. And I like what you said about taking on somebody else's label of success. Sometimes... We, we allow people to give it to us and we take it. And there's a choice. We don't necessarily have to accept that. We have to define what, that, what success is for us because the flip side to all that, Jonathan, is what I see is that when we're not able to live up to someone else's definition of success, then we label ourselves as failure. And that's right. wrong. Right? It's, it's wrong. Oh, definitely, definitely. Right? Yeah. We have to have what we consider to be successful. And there's levels to success. You know, one of the things that I get frustrated with, especially with some of the young people, is that they think it's overnight, and it is not overnight. That was one of the reasons why I – it was one of the brainchilds behind this show, because I really want people to see there is a journey, (laughs) you know, to success in whatever, you know, place and time that is for a person in their life. There there is a journey to get there. It doesn't happen overnight. They just don't – Oprah did not just wake up and become Oprah Winfrey in the the capacity that we know her to be, you know, this business and media mogul, right? There's – oh, my goodness. There's such a journey that everyone goes through, and it's usually a tough one because those people that have been through the greatest struggles are usually the ones that have the most to offer. And it was somebody that was on my show that actually said that um, a couple of weeks ago, and it was dead on. It was dead on. On the more we go through, the more we have to offer because we picked up some things and wisdom along the way that we were able right. to learn from. Right? So I, I love that you say that because everybody's definition is of success is different. But I also think what's important to, for people to realize is there are levels to this thing. There are levels to this thing, and it was actually mm-hmm. I think somebody else that came on the show that said that one day. And, but there really is levels to it because once you've hit one level of success, great then you can see beyond that one to get to the next one because you've learned so much to get there, right? So yeah, and you, know, mm-hmm. you know what hurts my feelings the most when I see it? Um, yeah. I'll be honest, I've noticed it, and that was, believe it or not, this was a, uh, I wouldn't say a battle, but this is a conversation that my parents and I had to have. But mm-hmm. um, when I went to school, I actually majored in statistics. So oh, um, wow. growing, growing up, I've always kind of liked math, but um, as I kind of went further and further through college, I realized that my true passion lied in working with students. Mm -hmm. And growing up, I've always had mentorship, leadership roles and things where I did events for people, and it was always oriented around helping other people. But again, when I was 17, my definition of success was placed for, I'll say, I accepted it but it, w- it wasn't something that I defined. It was something that I, I listened to other people, and I don't blame anyone for that. I take full responsibility for it, but yeah. I let 
everyone else's standard of what success be applied to my own life. So, yeah. you know, at some point I was chasing money and I wasn't chasing happiness. So when yeah. I got older and my confidence improved, I said, you know what? Who are you really doing this for? Are you doing this for other people in terms of your career? Are you doing this for yourself? What makes you happy? Yeah. So when we, when we talk to, especially, you know, kids who are interested in the arts, they're probably the most fragile population, mm. you know, those who want to go on to be musicians and writers yeah. and um, all filmmakers because we're always told, oh, there's not a lot of jobs, there's not a lot of this. And I've always seen it as why are we teaching our kids to kind of dumb down their dreams yep. because they won't make it? Why don't we teach our kids to be better at their skills? And they'll just be one of the subsets. So let's yep. say there's only 100 jobs to give and 1,000. Um, you know, total interest of people. Why don't we make our kids smart enough to become one of those 100 people instead of saying, oh, there's another 900, you'll never beat them, go sit at a desk. Yeah. And oh, I yeah. feel like that's the, sometimes that's the, the image that is portrayed to our kids. So, yeah. they'll, you know, I come across people every day who are engineers and they, they have these, these science and um, math-based majors, and there's nothing wrong with that. We need engineers. We need doctors. However, oh, yeah. when you talk to them, they're amazing dancers, they're amazing singers, and they had all of these dreams to perform, but they they got all of these restrictions put on them by their family saying, oh, if you do that, the chances of you ever making it are so small. And mm -hmm. somewhere along that, the flame kind of died for them. Yeah. So it, it, it's really hard to see because I'm like, no, chase the flame. If yeah. you're really good at this, you will always be the person who makes the auditions. You will always be the person who gets that spot. Right. Yeah, that's true. The only problem there, and I think you know this firsthand, is they want, they want to make sure that their heroes believe in them. And a lot of times their parents are their heroes. Absolutely. And if they don't believe in them, it almost, that's what thins the flame, you know? Yeah. So people don't, don't have that, that strength or resolve to be able to overcome that because acceptance is really the things that drive humans. That's what it, that drives most of us. Whether yes. we want to admit it or not, it does. We all want to be accepted. Um, and I can absolutely relate to what you were saying because Lord have mercy knows I chased, I chased the dollar bill for, for many, many years. And mm -hmm. um, I did things that, that got me accepted, but I wasn't always, pr always proud of some of the things that I had done. And it wasn't until I got weary of that because it was going against my value system so much that I got worn down from it and I said, hold it. <laughs> I have to really understand who it is I am. And then I just started running after the things that I know that I'm passionate about, which has kind of got me here today. But we all get there on our own journey. And sometimes we needed to go that route in order to come back to where we were. But I completely understand and, and agree with what you're saying. And it's tough. You know, it, it really is difficult. But I'm glad that you're still speaking to, to the spark, you know, to help people with the spark. Because sometimes there's a way for both of those things to live together. They can cohabitate. Mm -hmm. So, right? And, and I think that that's what gets, gets taken away from them because they have one choice versus how do both of these things cohabitate together, you know? Right. Because I think there's a way for that to happen. Yeah, yes, there I is. agree. I agree with that. So tell me, okay, so we're going to completely shift gears here because I want to talk to you a little bit about being an author. And tell me what the biggest lesson is you learned about being an author. Um, interestingly enough, we, we talked about it a little bit ago, but you had mentioned the statement that, success doesn't happen overnight. And yeah. when it comes to that, I didn't necessarily have the idea that the day I published the book, I was going to become a best-selling author. But what I didn't, I guess you'd say, give enough consideration to is how much of a business aspect it is to writing a book. I, you know, growing up, I don't know, I, I'll say I didn't know any other authors until I wrote my first book. I right. read books but I didn't know yeah. the people. I wasn't there for their journey or their process putting the book together. So not only was this new for me, this was new for my entire family. When I had my first book con, and the day of, everybody's calling me. What do I wear to this thing? I don't know. I'm, well, I'm trying to figure out what I got to put on, too. <laughs> right. so it, it, oh, it, yeah, it's I can new. relate. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's new for all of us at the same time. And mm -hmm. interestingly enough, it was kind of like, watching me do it for other people opened the door for them. So now I have several friends who are releasing books this year. Awesome. And it's 
it makes me, you know, so so proud inside to know that, like, you were a part of somebody else's journey because you took a, a faithful step. But even within it, um, my book was published in March of 2016. You know, we're in January 2017, so we're not even on a year yet that I've been in this, this new field and this new thing. And so many good things have happened, such as, you know, being on having the opportunity to appear on other radio shows, having the book featured in magazines, even the opportunity to go on Fox 5 DC News, which is coming up, and, oh, you know, nice. just having all of these, these platforms to talk about, which I feel is such a powerful book. But there were so many other, oh, my goodness, um, what we talked about the business aspect. I have sent probably close to 1,000 emails, and for the 1,000 that I've sent, I've probably heard from 75 of those people. Wow. So you, you have to be someone who is very resilient and open to the fact that every opportunity you're interested in, it may not work out for you. You yeah. know, for every, for every idea that you have and every person who tells you that, you know, it may work out, there's another 10 that may not even write you back. And it, it's right. a very, like, kind of quick learning curve because you're like, oh, you know, wow, I didn't know it would go like this. But that's why I said, like, the business aspect. I know something that hits a lot of young people, myself uh, included previously, but um, returning voicemails. You know, we're just not a generation that leaves voicemails. We are a texting and email generation, but a lot of people that I conduct business with are still on a voicemail system. So my mom was like, you're going to have to get in the habit of leaving those voicemails setting up. I mean, I already had my voicemail set up, but, you know, just making sure that you're checking it regularly, that your mailbox doesn't get full, that they yep. send you an email, like making sure you get back to people in a timely fashion, you know, the art of follow-up, the art of just professionalism when you're meeting with them, making sure that when you're discussing business, you tell someone you're going to meet them at 3 o'clock to discuss the idea. You're actually there at 3 o'clock, um, business casual or business professional when you're just, you know, doing things on behalf of it. So a lot of just, like I said, that business aspect had to get a lot stronger. Mm -hmm. Um and I thought it was really the writing aspect that was going to take me over and, you know, really make it. But in reality, it is that business part. So for anybody who's out there interested in writing a book, make sure that as you're working on your writing skills that you are also working on your business skills. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And you actually kind of answered my next question, which was who you were before writing the book versus today's version of yourself. And it sounds like, you're a lot more organized and you're more focused on the business aspect of things, but would you say that there's more to it than that? Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny, but I, when I wrote a book, one of my goals is that I want people to look at a new book being released, how young people look at a new CD being released. You know, when Beyonce comes out with a CD, everybody's going crazy. The world stops. Everyone's downloading the songs on whatever platforms it's available on. You could say the same thing for Jay-Z, J. Cole, all of our, you know, most valued musicians. But when mm -hmm. a book comes out, it just kind of comes out, you yeah. know, depending on who the, who the author is. And there are a lot of good books in the world, and they're not all just published and written by celebrities. They're, you know... Right. Every day, you and me, folks who just want to make a difference in the world, sharing from our experiences. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I really want to change the culture of what it means to be an author. Because, see, when a person is a, is a musician, they travel the world, and they do all of these great things. So, believe it or not, I have kind of, even though, yes, I wrote a book, but I have treated it as though I published a song. And oh, wow. I, I try to get people as excited about this book as they would about a CD. Mm -hmm. So I think about, um, I actually go on YouTube and I, I watch a lot of interviews of singers and see, like, what types of questions they're asked because think about it, they're writing songs so that they can record the song and we write books so that we can publish books. So in some, in some ways, they're kind of like cut or brothers and sisters with you. It just, like, towards the end, it takes a little bit of a different step. So I'm, I'm constantly watching, like, musicians and things like that. Even um, have submitted a proposal to, like, certain networks and award shows about, we, you know, we talk about entertainment, we recognize actors, musicians, and things. What about a category for authors on, like, the BET Awards or the MTV Awards that we really want to put the component of literacy back in the homes? Why don't we start spotlighting authors like we do um, Song of the Year why can't Book of the Year be one of the categories at one of these award shows? Right. That's a great idea. Maybe somebody will hear it listening to the show. 
<laughs> I think that that's a I think that that's a great idea. But um, but I want to give you a chance to to tell us how this book is different than most self help books. So um, one of my favorite things about Master of Ceremonies is that it is a mixture of how to with a little bit of why. And I say why because the first half talks about how to improve yourself. Um, it's, the section is called Master of the Kingdom. The kingdom represents you. Um, so it talks about things like time management, self-esteem, how to manage your relationships with family, friends, dating and stuff, spirituality. Those are all kind of things that you can kind of control. The second half of the book is Master of the Jungle, and the jungle represents the outside world that you don't have control over. So now we're talking about, um, for example, traveling out of town by yourself for the first time. So if you've been on an airplane, you know there are certain things you can't even take to the airport or they're going to confiscate and throw them out or for, um, potentially not allow you to get on that plane. Um, there are diagrams in the book where a person reading it has the opportunity to uh, fill out their monthly budget, what are their expenses, um, how much money are they bringing in, and figure out kind of what they have to work with each month. Then there are also things like, believe it or not, one of the sections has recipes on it. I wrote a, a chapter on living on your own and potentially having a roommate. So, okay, you're a 24-year-old single bachelor. You have a roommate. You all live in a two-bedroom apartment. Who figures out who buys toilet paper and the pots and pans and the things like that? Or will it always fall on you? Uh, what about when it's time to vacuum the floor? Are you the person who always does it? Do they always do it? What is your system for living with other people? So like I said, that half of the book more so is a, a how-to. And with self-help books, I've noticed a lot of them that I have read tend to give you, you know, encouragement, like this is how, um, this is why you should love yourself. But sometimes you don't always see how to love yourself, like those nitty-gritty steps when it's finally time to get up out of your bed and put your shoes on. What do I do next? Right. And with my book, I wanted to help them with that part. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm at the airport. What do I do once I check in? Mm -hmm. Now I'm on the plane. What do I do once I'm on the plane? Now I'm off the plane. What do I do once I'm off the plane? Those types of mm -hmm. things. So, right. It's those things that you might want to you would ask somebody that has experience with it, but you might be a little embarrassed to ask somebody that you don't know because you think it's more obvious than maybe it is. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, like I, I like said, that. the recipe part is always cool. Um, believe it or not, one of my favorite desserts is banana pudding, and that recipe is even in there. So I put five recipes oh, wow. in there that I felt <laughs> any eligible uh, bachelor young male would be able to create with little to no money or little to no um, supply. Well, I think they appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I have a feeling a lot of their girlfriends will be reading that part of the book, but uh, <laughs> yes. that's pretty good. I like it. I like it. I like it. Well, Jonathan, my goodness, we've come to the end of our time already. It went by so fast. Yes, it does. We go, oh, my gosh, it goes by fast. But before we go, I want, um, are there any projects or events or anything that you have coming up that you want to let folks know about? Yes, I actually do. Um, I recently released uh, my blog called The Classy Gent Chronicles. It can be found on my uh, website, again, JonathanCHarris.com. And basically the Classy Gent Chronicles are just different things that I've experienced that I want to share in the form of a blog. It comes out every Tuesday, so every Tuesday you can expect a new blog post. Um, I am working on releasing my second book, a children's book called Growing Gents, and I'm actually going to have it available on my birthday, July 26th. Okay. So I hope that for those of you who have um, young nephews, young children, um, grandchildren, or just anyone in your life that you want to help teach little kids ages three to seven about the importance of values and being a gentleman, I think that would be a really good book for you to pick up. And um, other than that, like I said, I'm just continuing to develop my um, life coaching business. I'm also working on a software app to help teens get some of their um, questions answered and just give them different resources to be successful. Awesome. Wow. Sounds like you've got a lot on the docket, my friend. That's good stuff. <laughs> That's good stuff. So we're going to have to keep up with you. And before we go, one more time, tell our listeners how they can connect with you. All right, everyone. So, again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Author John. And please visit my website, www.johnsoncharris.com. 
Again, my book, Master of Ceremonies, A Male's Guide for a Successful Life, is on that site where you can purchase it. Perfect. Jonathan, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you on the show today. Thank you so much. Listeners, I encourage you to reach out to me on my Facebook page at Shifting the Atmosphere with Federica. Here you can participate in discussions or find information on upcoming shows. I encourage you to visit my new website, www.shiftingtheatmosphere.net. Here you'll find information about upcoming shows and events and have access to past shows. Be sure to pick up my best-selling book, Breakthrough Leadership, available on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and iBooks. Until next time, be well and be blessed.